Hello, my name is Peter and I'm involved with the sign language ministry during third service at 1130. I've been involved in sign language ministry for quite some time, for several years. And what I've noticed with our deaf members is that they have their eyes open. And that's simply because sign language is a visual and a beautiful language. But if a deaf person closes their eyes while the interpreter is praying, they're not able to see because their eyes are closed. So with me trying to think about the concept of having your eyes open, realizing it has a strong impact because it's not only your eyes open, but it's also having the eyes of your heart open. Similarly to the concept of how your eyes are open by this sign, I sign it on my heart, showing that my eyes to my heart are open. And that way, as I open myself up, I can be able to create these relationships with the people around me. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for everything that you do. This church is like a family and we support each other. And at the same time, we have a community that surrounds us that needs more of Jesus. You set this church here for that reason. As we look at the message, the series that we focus on this concept of prayer, I pray that it becomes a strong tool. And I know that for us, needing to have our eyes open, we also have to have our hearts open as we look at the people around us. So today I pray that we keep our hearts open as we see those that are around us. I pray for the message as Kevin and Sherry provide that. You empower them so that this message spreads throughout our community as we look up to you and glorify you. I thank you so much for us to learn this in both our minds and our hearts as you open us up. Thank you so much. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And Lord Jesus, thank you for those who are part of our hearing impaired community and that they're teaching us to pray with our eyes open even as they pray with their eyes open so they can hear each other's prayers as it's being signed. Lord, thank you, Jesus, that as we pray with our eyes open, we can pray continually through our days. Thank you that we can pray with our ears open and hear you, God, as you speak through your word, as you speak through people and circumstances and by your Holy Spirit. And today, God, we pray that you would help us to, to speak to you with our hearts wide open, knowing that we'll come near to you and seek your face when we understand your love. Speak to us of your love this day, that we can trust you and follow you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians, as he writes the letter to the church in Ephesus, in chapter 1, verse 18, he lifts up this prayer, and I want you to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul's prayer. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, that's us, the church, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. We can pray to God with our eyes closed, with our eyes open, in any posture. We can listen for God because God is speaking. He's a good shepherd and he speaks to his sheep. And we can pray to him with our hearts open. And our prayer today is that you will discover a new depth of understanding God's love for you. Because when you know someone loves you, when you know you can trust them, man, you're drawn near to people like that. Well, when we know our God loves us and we can trust him, we're drawn to him in prayer. In the prayer that Kevin just read in Ephesians 1, the Apostle Paul prayed that the eyes of your heart may be open to the incomparable great power to those who would believe. You see, Paul's reminding us that there is no power that compares to God's. In the book of Isaiah, in the Old Testament, in chapter 46, verses four and five, God says to his people, I have made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. To whom will you compare me or count me equal? You see, God is saying that there's none like him who has the power to carry. 
No one can rescue like he can. And no one can sustain like he can. And that's why we pray with our hearts wide open. Because he has proven to us that he is trustworthy. If we're going to be praying with our hearts wide open, we have to remember to keep our eyes on who God is and to remember what he has freely offered to all who believe in him. I learned a lesson of trust when our kids were two, four, and six. We lived in Granville, Michigan, and in Granville there was a park, Johnson Park. And I remember the very first time I drove the boys to Johnson Park. One of the first things they saw was a slide that looked pretty much like this. It was one of those big metal slides. How many of you remember those slides? Okay, we don't see them anymore. I, I think that they don't pass the safety regulations anymore, <laughs> right? Most of them are plastic, because we know these got really hot when the sun beat on them. And, and, and it was pretty narrow, and they were high. And one distinctive that I recall pretty vividly is the pit at the bottom. For a lot of them that were really tall, they had quite a big drop, which made it not very safe for smaller kids. Nonetheless, Zach runs to the slide, climbs up, sits down, and zoom, he goes down. Josh follows along, climbs up the ladder, sits down, zoom, he goes down. Nate makes it all the way to the top, he sits at the base and freezes in fear. He realized this was not a good time to follow his bigger brothers. Now as he's looking around and looking at the height, fear settles in. Now, I am coming, I'm following along after the boys, watching what was happening, and two thoughts went through my mind. One, I don't know how I can safely even get him down. And two, I don't want to go up there and bring him down because I want him to have an experience of this great slide. And I knew if I didn't somehow get him through this, it would take a long time to get him back up that slide again. So I went to the base of the slide. I went down in that little sand pit and I looked up at Nate. I started, I appealed to his pride. I said, Nate, you can do this. I know you can do it, Nate. You can do it, Nate. Nothing. <laughs> Thought more about, okay, what, what would motivate Nate? Okay, what about a little pressure, <laughs> a little peer pressure? Hey, Nate, your brothers did it. Zach did it. Josh did it. You can do it too. You're a big boy now. You can do it, Nate. Nothing. Still frozen, grabbing a little bit tighter. So now I'm thinking, okay, what other resources do I have? Well, at the Harney House, we had what we called the treasure box. Now, um, it had little prizes and trinkets and stickers. And some would say that the treasure box would be considered bribery, but um, I always called them little thank you, no, little thank you gifts to, to, to get the kids to behave in a way that we desired at that certain moment. But anyway, so I didn't pull it out very often, but this seemed worthy of that. So I said, Nate, if you go down the slide right now, I will let you pick a prize out of the treasure box when we get home. And I will even let your brothers pick one too. Well, now I got the two boys chiming in, thinking for sure this will work. Nothing. In desperation, I moved in. I looked at Nate and I said, Nathan, look at me. Do you know how much I love you? He shook his head. I'm your mom. You can trust me. I will catch you. The minute I said that, down he went. Caught him. And he looked at me and said, can I do that again, mom? <laughs> I said, absolutely, Nate. Because you see, it wasn't the prize. It wasn't the pressure. And it wasn't the pride that got him to move out of fear. But he had an understanding of who his mom was, how much his mom loved him, and that when I said to him that I had the ability to catch him, he could trust that. That's what moved him past his fear. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about earthly parents and what they offer in comparison to our Heavenly Father. Matthew 7, verses 9 and 11, Jesus says this, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? 
If you, then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? A dad, a good dad or mom, wouldn't trick their son or daughter, and when they asked for a piece of bread, give them a stone. No, that would never happen. The point being made here is that if an earthly parent will give their children what they need when they ask, so much more will our perfect heavenly father give us what we need when we ask for it. Jesus spoke these words as he was nearing the end of the Sermon on the Mount because he wanted the disciples to know that the source of their stability would not be themselves, but it would come from knowing that they were children of the living God. In this passage, when it says ask, it simply means to pray. We're encouraged to ask of our perfect heavenly Father. You can pray with your heart wide open, to this kind of God, to a perfect father, because he knows what is good, and he has every ability to give it to you. So whatever slide you find yourself on, maybe it's frustration, or fear, or disappointment, and it's got, it's got you frozen. I want you to recall this moment in the sermon, and keep your eyes on God. Remembering his great love for you and his ability to hear what you ask of him and to move in ways that will be good for you. So keep your eyes fixed on the one who loves you. He can be trusted. You can pray with your eyes, with your ears, with your heart wide open to receive the help that only God can give the God who gives an incomparable power to those who believe in him. So the question is, do you believe that God loves you and do you believe that God can be trusted? And and, and most Christians will say, of course I do. But I want to pause there for a minute and really ask ourselves, do I live with a confidence that God loves me and God can be trusted because things don't always go our way. And every one of us in the last month or right now or in the next month, we're gonna face something where where we don't understand what's going on and we say, do I truly understand that God loves me and can be fully trusted? Because that transforms our prayer life and our relationship with him. So I I wanna just take for granted this idea that God actually loves you and can be trusted. And if you believe that, then, and if you're a note taker, this is the place in, your, in the bulletin, there's a place to write some notes down here if you want to collect some thoughts there, if that's helpful for you. God loves you and can be fully trusted, so first, you can approach his throne of grace with confidence and boldness. You can actually come before the very throne of God confidently and boldly. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We should actually enter into God's presence. We're talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of all things, and we should actually come right to his throne room. This is a picture of prayer, coming to the throne of God, and do it with confidence. Well, why why don't we so often? Well, I think it's because we live in a world that has all kinds of boundaries. If you're traveling, and you stopped off in Washington, D.C., and you said to yourself, you know, I'm going to drop in and say hi to the president. I'm just going to go up to the White House, knock on the door, you know. Hey, can the president come out and play? Can we hang out? I'm talking not, not just, you know, any president over time, just in the last 50 years. And, you know, just go, I'm just going to go say hi to the president. How would things go if you decided you were going to walk up to the door of the White House and ask to talk to the president? How do you think that would go for you? Not real good. And you say, well, they've got, they've got a big gate. That's okay. I'm a pretty good climber. I'll climb over the gate. Problem? Yeah, serious problem. It just doesn't work that way. Take, take it to England. And you want to visit the queen. We were actually in England and the queen was having a tea at Buckingham Palace. And we were outside of Buckingham Palace. And there were people lined up going into the Buckingham Palace, out the gate, and down the road as far as you could see. They all had their invitation in their hand, wearing their absolute finest, the craziest hats you've ever seen, and just all dressed up and waiting. 
And we apparently, our invitation got lost in the mail because we had not been invited to have tea with the queen. And so we're looking at all these people. And at that moment, if I said, well, yeah, it's okay. I'm going to just jump into line and just kind of go follow someone in and go in. Is that going to work? No, because there's gates and there's blockades. That's the world we live in. I have friends in Monterey that I can't go visit them without going through a gate. Some people live in a whole city that's a gated city. It's called Pebble Beach. You have to go through a gate to get in there. Some neighborhoods are gated. That's, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that's the world we live in, right? Now, here's the point. The God of heaven, the King of kings and Lord of lords, says this to you. If you know me through faith in Jesus, my door's always open. Come on in. That's pretty amazing. I mean, that, that's an invitation to prayer, to come near to God, to be close to him. God loves you and can be fully trusted. So, a second thing, you can ask him for greater intimacy. Because you can trust God, because he loves you, you can actually say, God, I want to feel closer to you. I want to draw nearer to you. I want to have a more intimate relationship with you. No, if you're a Christian, no matter how long, you, how long you've been a Christian, no matter how much you love Jesus, there's more intimacy with God than you've experienced yet. I guarantee you, you have not experienced the fullness of heaven yet and closeness with God. And God keeps, wants to keep drawing you closer and closer to him. In, in, uh, in Galatians chapter 3, there's this amazing passage that talks about we're children of God. And, th and then the Apostle Paul gives these pictures of people and groups that are sort of left out and not included, not kind of an intimate connection, and how God breaks down those barriers. Listen to these words from Galatians 3, verse 26 to 29. So in Christ Jesus... You are all children of God through faith. If you put faith in Christ Jesus, you become a son or daughter of God. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This picture is staggering. What the Apostle Paul is saying is, in the ancient world, there were these, these massive divisions. There, there, were, there were people that were in and people that were out. And if you were out, you were out. And what he's saying is, in Jesus Christ, it all goes away. He's not saying that men aren't men and women aren't women. He's not saying that people's heritage as Jewish and Gentile are no longer there. He's saying, in, in Christ's mind, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't separate you. So, so he says, you know, okay, now the Jewish people, believe there was two groups of people in the world. Jewish people and everyone else. And everyone else was called a Gentile. As a matter of fact, if you came to the temple and you were a Gentile, you could come into the outer temple, but you couldn't come in the inner temple. There was a separation. But he says, in Christ, that all goes away. He says, in the ancient world, there were slaves and there were free people. And free people had prerogative and privilege and entree vous, and slaves did not. And the apostle Paul says, in Christ, that all goes away. Everyone's invited in. In the ancient world, men had a certain position and women in some cultures couldn't even speak in public. This is radical. The Apostle Paul says, in Christ, that just disappears. What is it in your heart that makes you say, I don't know if God would want me to come really close to him. I don't know if God, I mean, I mean there's things I've done and things I've said and things I've thought and things I'm still doing and God wouldn't want to be close to me. In Jesus Christ, through faith in him, that all goes away. Whatever your reason is that you can't be close to God, if you come to him through faith in Jesus, that reason just disappears in the heart of God and in the face of Jesus Christ and at the foot of the cross. God loves you and can be fully trusted so you can be yourself when you come near him. You can come to God as you are. You can be yourself. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. God's kingdom belongs to little kids. I think the idea is this. When a little kid comes, kind of comes out of, and kind of comes out forward to somebody, they come as they are. They're not putting on a show. We get older and we learn to put on airs and, and put on masks and all that stuff, but not little kids. They just come as they are. And, and, and this, this uh, wonderful song at the, at the end of every Billy Graham crusade for decades, this guy, George Beverly Shea, wrote this song. And, and, and Jesus, uh, it's called Just As I Am, and he would sing this song as people came forward to receive Jesus. And here's the opening, opening verse of the song. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, 
O Lamb of God, I come, I come to come as you are. When you know God's love and you know that, that you can trust him, you stop putting on a show and you just come to God. I praise God for my parents, for my dad and my mom. As they were raising me, they affirmed who I was and then challenged me to be more than I was. But they always affirmed who I was. I was born before uh, we had invented ADD and ADHD and ADHD, HDHD. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying before we had names for this. Back when I was a kid, they had a term for kids like that that was called naughty. <laughs> Anybody remember those days? And it, you know, it, that, it, that was how it was. And I was, and I, if, I, if they could have diagnosed me then, I would have been like ADHD, HDHD squared or something. I mean, I was just like, I was, I, even right now, I don't, I, don't drink, I don't drink caffeine. I don't. I just, I'm wound up. And I've been like this since the moment I was born. And my, I remember my parents saying to me, Kevin, we love your energy. We love your enthusiasm and energy. Now, there's times you have to sit still. They loved who I was and wanted to be more than I was. But they affirmed that. My parents said to me, we love that you talk a lot. But sometimes you need to not talk, like during class and certain times. They, they, but they kept saying, we love fundamentally who you are. And they didn't, they didn't try to stop me from being who God made me to be. And I praise God for that. And I believe that our Heavenly Father looks and says, I love you like you are right now. And I want you to become more than what you are right now. But I love you right where you are. We can draw near to him in prayer because he opens his arms to us right where we are. God loves you and can be fully trusted. So you can pray with no fear. You can come before God with no fear. 1 John 4, 18 says this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. And here's the reason why. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. If you've come to Jesus Christ, or if you choose to come to Jesus, and accept what he did on the cross when he died for your sins and paid the price and took all the punishment for your wrongs, if you receive Jesus, all your sins are gone. The, the, way, the, the way it's written in Psalm 103, verse 12 is this. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as you can go from east to west, infinitely far in each direction, is you and your sins, if you come to Jesus. He takes them and he removes them as far as you can imagine. And so there is no fear of punishment. Why? Because Jesus took my sins. And Jesus washed me clean. And if you're a Christian, you'll stand before God one day. And he'll say, I see nothing but the cleanliness of Jesus and the holiness of Jesus because Jesus took your sins. You can draw near to God without fear. And, and, I, and I love these words in 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Listen to this. And that is what we are. When you believe that and know that, you can draw near to God with confidence. The great American author and pastor A.W. Tozer said this, <clears throat> what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Were we able to extract from any person a complete answer to the question, what comes into your mind when you think about God? We might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. Whether we like it or not, what we think about God determines how we approach him in prayer. So I want to pause just a, just a moment and ask you to think about what you think about God. And then think about how this view or views of God affects your prayer life. Because if you see God as an angry God, you won't open your heart to him. You won't talk with him. If you see him as disinterested or distant, you won't try to be near to him. And if you see him as a God who's lots of demands and, and actually you can't even live up to those demands, you're not going to approach him with eyes that see what he first is giving to you. 
Oswald Chambers, who wrote the classic devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest, says the battle of prayer is against two things. One, wandering thoughts, and two, a lack of intimacy with God's character. Our message this morning is trying to lay the foundation of God's character as being a loving God. God is love. Also, that God is present. He is always near. And that he moves in power, that power that doesn't compare to any other power in the whole world. We have to think about what we think about God. You know, I became a Christian when I was young, and for several years um, after I accepted Christ, I didn't really realize that the picture that I had of God was really getting in the way of fully understanding how much he loved me. You see, I, I knew he loved me because I knew that God was love, and the just this theological understanding that he, he had to love me, the nature of who he was. But I got into trouble when I started to understand how he should love me through my own eyes. I was painfully aware of how I was falling short, and the focus became inward on me instead of what he was offering to me. It wasn't until I was in my middle 20s that Kevin and I went to a conference in Danville, California, and the speaker shared a story that broke through my limited picture of God's love. The story the speakers told, it was Brennan Manning who told the story, was about a priest named Edward Farrell. Edward lived in Detroit, Michigan. He had an uncle who would be turning 80 in Ireland. So when it came close to his uncle's birthday, he flew to Ireland to be with his uncle on that great day. They got up in the morning, dressed, didn't say a word to one another, drove out to the lake shore and sat there for about 20 minutes. Nobody said a word watching the sun rise. Then, unexpectedly, Uncle Seamus gets up and he just starts skipping. His face is beaming. He's got a smile that goes from ear to ear and tears of joy are streaming down his face. Edward yells out to Uncle Seamus, Uncle Seamus, you look so very happy. Do you want to tell me why? He turned around, he said, yes, lad. You see, me Abba is very fond of me. My father is very fond of me. As I sat there listening to this amazing picture of a man who got the sweetness of God's love, that the father was fond of of him, something broke in me. And I realized that I didn't have that right picture of God towards me. And I cried, I, I couldn't stop crying. Some of the tears were for what I had missed all those years, but more than that, they were tears of joy because through that telling of that story, somehow the Holy Spirit broke through my heart and I got in a bigger, better way that God was fond of me. I was looking to him and not how I thought he was looking at me. And I was freed and I found out that I was God's beloved child. I had never before that skipped <laughs> or stood in awestruck wonder at the love of God, just worshiped God for his love for me. God would get, I, I had never got lost in his love for me. From that day on, everything would begin to change. I started to realize that God actually wanted to be with me. And I found out that I wanted to be with this God who was fond of me, who loved me and liked me. Our prayer this morning is that you understand this picture of a staggering love that God has, this kind of love 
where he gave up his only son so that you could experience it. You can truly experience the nearness of God when you fully grasp his love for you. In Philippians 4, 4 through 7, it tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. You've probably heard that. Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul says, I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your, gentle, your gentleness be evident to all. And this is a piece I think people forget. The Lord is near. That's why you can rejoice. We don't rejoice in us, but we rejoice in who is with us. And goes on to say, because the Lord is near and he offers that incomparable great power, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer, ask. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So when Sherry says that, as she heard that story, she cried, um, she cried for hours, for hours. Just, just this, uh, this growing awareness of the greatness of the love of God. And what I've learned from Sherry through the years, we started this series uh, three weeks, uh, two weeks ago about looking at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 where it says, pray continually. And Sherry talks about how when she used to read that passage about pray continually, it's like, what a chore. I'm going to be falling short. I can't pray continually. What a hard job it is. And she said, all of a sudden she realized, it's not that I have to pray continually. It's that I get to. I could talk with God anytime. His heart is open. His arms are open. And everything changes when you understand the greatness of God's love. You want to pray. And that's what the Apostle Paul is capturing when he writes to the church at Ephesus. And if you have your Bibles or if you have your app, Bible app, open up to Ephesians 6, 18 and, and mark this verse. This is a powerful verse. It might be one you may want to memorize. It's powerful. I want you to notice all the alls. There's three alls, maybe a fourth one if you take it all ways. But there's three or four alls in one verse. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions. With all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That's a lot of alls for one verse. But I think what the Apostle Paul is getting at is when you know the love of God, when you know the grace of God, you don't, you don't go, oh, I, I, I should remember to pray, I ought to pray. You talk to God, because this God loves you, this God is near, this God is powerful, this, this God is approachable. You can come to him with confidence. And so I want to challenge you. Uh, to, to make a commitment, to try to pray the alls. Not just this week, but as a kind of a lifestyle. So pray on all occasions. Say, well, when's the right time to pray? Well, boy, when I'm happy, when things are good, when the sky's blue, when I got plenty of money in the bank, when things are just, my body feels great, pray, absolutely. And also, when I'm struggling, when the sky is cloudy, when I'm struggling with our finances, when, when relationships are tense, that's a great time to pray. Pray at all times, on all occasions. It's always a good time to talk with a God who loves you, who has the door wide open to you. And then, with all kinds of prayers. You say, well, what are all kinds of prayers? Let me give you a little tool to remember four. I can't tell you all the kinds of prayer, but let me give you four of them. And I learned this as a young Christian. The book of Acts, A-C-T-S, you use that as a little acronym, A-C-T-S. Here's four ways to pray. A, adoration. God, you're beautiful, you're wonderful. It's amazing what you've done. Just adore God for who he is. That's the A in Acts. The C, confession. God, I'm sorry, I messed up, I blew it. You say, well, if I'm forgiven in Jesus, do I still need to confess? Well, my wife knows I love her, but when I mess up, I still say I'm sorry most of the time, right? Yeah, and, and there's still something about saying I'm sorry. I mean, she knows I love her, she loves me, but, but when you mess, so with God, just say confession. God, I messed up, I'm sorry for that. I don't wanna live that way anymore. Adoration, confession, the T of Acts is thanksgiving. Just give thanks to God. You say, for, for what? Anything and everything you can think of. Make a list and then make another list and notice God's goodness and give him thanks. And then the S is supplication. Supplication is, is asking of God. God, will you help me with this? Will you help someone I care about, about this? And you pray for others, you pray for yourself, you ask God for things. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. There's four ways to pray. So he says, he says, he says pray with all kinds of prayers and requests. That gets you started. There's four ways to pray. And then as he says, praying for all of the Lord's people. Pray for all God's people. 
there's a reason at Shoreline we pray for another local church every Sunday. Because we are part of something bigger than ourselves. We are part of a family of God that spans this community and this nation and this world and all time. And so we pray for other churches. We pray for other Christians. And, and we should. That's, that's God's desire. That's God's design. That's being the body of Christ. And some people are like, well, why, why are you praying for other churches around your community? I mean, they're the competition. It's like, no. They're not the competition. They're family. We belong to each other. This last week, I had lunch with some pastors from the area here. I actually invited them because I was going to tell them a little bit more about the Organic Outreach Conference coming up in a couple weeks and wanted to give invitations to them to give to their congregations. And, and so I met with Pastor Ben and another pastor from Cypress Church down on, on Highway 68 here. And also Pastor Mike from Monterey Church was there. And then Pastor Tony, the brand new pastor at, at, a, at a church in Pacific Grove at, uh, at Mayflower Presbyterian Church. And he's just new in the area. And he came and showed up for lunch. And you know, we talked for about 10, 15 minutes about the conference. And we got all the information done. I handed out the stuff. We spent the next hour just talking about Tony, this new pastor, and asking about him and getting to know him. And he went to some of our stories. And then we spent time just praying over him and praying over his church and this new call of ministry. And I could just tell, he was just kind of like, this, this is amazing. Because what he realized is these other pastors, we love him. And we love his church and we want his church to thrive because it's part of our family. So we pray at all times, in all circumstances, with all kinds of prayers for all of God's people. And when you pray with your heart wide open, you know the love of God, you just want to pray more. I want to ask you, if you're able physically, if you'd stand with me. And we're going to sing one song to close, but I'm going to ask Jerry to come and join me. And you can close your eyes or you can open your eyes. You can stand if you're able to. And, and I want to just invite you to join me in prayer and then join me in singing praise to God. Oh God, we thank you that we can talk to you anytime, anywhere. And Lord, this is our prayer. That we would learn to pray in all circumstances, in all situations, with all kinds of prayer for all of your people. Lord, that'll keep us busy. But Lord, it's not about being busy. It's about being connected to you. So connect our hearts to you, oh God. That we may love you more and know your love and trust you and follow you. And now, Lord, as we close this service, lifting our hearts in praise. Let us, with, from the depth of our soul, lift our voices to you. Let's worship the Lord together.